largest city. There were a lot of words. Some said riot, others were content to put her down to a disturbance. But no matter what you call it, the rampage through Toronto's downtown has left its mark. In comparison to last week's events in Los Angeles, it was tame. But for those who thought Canada was immune to the urban problems of the United States, it was a shattering wake-up call. The windows of more than 100 stores were smashed, and in the end, 37 police officers and three police horses were injured. 38 people were arrested, 10 were charged. Tonight, there's still no word on civilian injuries, and there's been no official estimate of the amount of damage done. The tension continued tonight. Hundreds of young people gathered in the city's downtown, and Toronto's police force was there to meet them. Here's the CBC's Kelly Crow. Tonight began to look a little bit like last night. Young people and police facing off in a major downtown Toronto intersection. It all happened just a few hours after Police Chief William McCormick made this assurance. There has been an indication of a few people that are gathering, a few young people that are gathering with an idea that they might continue uh, what happened last night. I can assure you they won't be. A larger than usual crowd of young people had gathered at a popular downtown mall. Police responded with a large show of force. For a jumpy city, it's an unsettling reminder of last night's damage. Damage people spent all day trying to repair. Ready? One, yeah. two. Oh. It was left to these men to rebuild what appeared to be a fragile city this morning. This is the night call now. What's your day been like? Uh, my head's killing me right now. I got a severe headache. I just want to go home and I uh, wish this doesn't happen again. I mean, the money's good, but the city doesn't need this. The glass trucks were side by side along Young Street, replacing dozens of plate glass windows broken in the rampage last night. How much does it cost to put in a new window like that? The window? I don't know, probably $1,500. The cost of the windows was just one aspect of the damage being counted today. It's a mess. <laughs> Several shop owners were also counting lost merchandise, grabbed through broken windows by an angry crowd. About, uh, yeah, I yeah, have, have a story about $1,000. Yeah, $1,000. Take my watches, CD, all calculated display, the whatever you have it, can, uh, cordless telephone answering machine. Whatever you have it, you take it. How much uh, do you think you lost? Uh, Twenty-five to thirty thousand over. Yeah, I'm just coming by to see how things were. Uh, crazy. I, uh, I, uh, the sight of a shattered Young Street clearly upset Toronto residents. When I saw, saw the stuff that happened in LA, I didn't think, you know, that that was going to happen in Toronto. Toronto, Toronto are good. You know, you look at Toronto, it's always been like, you know, the, the peaceful, quiet. You can walk down on the street and don't look over, you know. But now it's like, it's scary, you know. I don't know. And it was scary again tonight as police dealt with this confrontation. But by about 11 o'clock, police appeared to have the situation under control. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto. Tonight's events were confined to a single block. Last night, though, was very different. The rampage taking place over several blocks in the city's downtown core. It was 4 o'clock when hundreds of people gathered outside the U.S. consulate. They were protesting against the Rodney King verdict in Los Angeles and Saturday's shooting of a black man by Toronto police. Less than half an hour later, the crowd began to move north to the city's busiest intersection, Young and Bloor. Here, they had a peaceful sit-in, blocking traffic. At about 6 o'clock, the crowd headed back down Young Street towards the city's major shopping complex, the Eaton Centre, and Toronto City Hall. People threw rocks at windows and police. <laughs> By 
By 7.15, the crowd gathered force as it headed back up Young Street. And here's where things began to take a turn for the worse. Police began to realize how bad things were. They moved in on horseback and closed off Young Street. People to go home, okay? Eight thirty, and the crowd began to get smaller. It moved west, where people rushed walls of police. There were some injuries here, none serious. Senseless violence, bullshit, man. Behind the wall here, please. By 9.30, the situation had calmed down considerably. There was some sporadic violence as police dispersed the last of the crowd. came as swiftly as the rampage. In Ottawa, the Prime Minister acknowledged that racism is a problem in Canada, but he stressed it's not as widespread as some allege. There was other reaction, too, right across the country, but the bulk of it was where the problem was, in Toronto. Here's Alan Garr. Stopped right when it started. This, this morning, a young man put a question to a police officer that a lot of people were asking. Why was there no police officer around at all when people were breaking windows? Why did you let it happen? I didn't let it happen, sir. You did? Why didn't you do something? Anything? Not like... my decision. Whose decision was it? I have no idea. Well, in fact, these people were in charge, senior members of the Toronto again? Police Department. And in spite of the widespread damage, they reject the suggestion that they were unprepared. Let me assure you that we were not caught off guard, as you would suggest. On the contrary, the matter was contained and was admirably dealt with under the circumstances. But I'm suggesting to you that it has not been normally the case for a demonstration of this, this nature to dis disintegrate the in the manner it did. But that's what happened, and, and the, the people who arranged it said it was not what they had that. planned. We are not about to destroy our homes, because this is our home. We pay our taxes. We contribute to this society. We are not about to destroy our homes, nor to propagate ideas <clears throat> in the community about destruction. Black leaders called on Toronto's Mayor June Rowlands this morning. She was looking for ways to defuse the situation. After the meeting, she said the destruction had little to do with the issue of race. What happened afterwards, of course, was nothing that was instigated by the leaders and the people that organized that demonstration. She said it had a lot to do with alienated youth, and she wants the provincial government to help. We definitely need programs for this summer. The unemployment is, is very high. And we simply can't afford to have youth frustrated and unhappy and unemployed on the streets of Toronto. The chair of the Toronto Police Commission, Susan Ng, agrees that the problem goes beyond policing. It is a societal issue. And there is a thin membrane that holds it all together. And no number of police officers and no show of force is going to be enough if society does not take some action to resolve the divisions. That approach may work in the long run, but in the short run, one decision has already been made. Police will meet future demonstrations with a greater show of force. That includes Thursday, when the black community plans to protest treatment of blacks by police. Alan Gar, CBC News, Toronto. The original protest, the tension behind it, was about race, about a system some believe treats minorities and blacks in particular unfairly. The protesters say that's what happened at the Rodney King trial in Los Angeles, and they believe it also happens here. Whether it actually does is something that's not easy to answer. But as our social affairs specialist Karen Webb reports, there are clearly a lot of questions. To Toronto's black community, the list has become a litany. 
Wade Lawson, shot and killed while fleeing in a stolen car. Officers acquitted. Sophia Cook, shot in a car stopped by police. Charges dropped. Marlon Neal, shot after running a radar trap. Officer acquitted. In the last five years, those three plus four others. And then early Saturday morning, Raymond Lawrence, shot and killed while threatening an officer with a knife. Community leaders like Bev Folk say many young black people believe the police shoot first, ask questions later. If we are being killed, if we are being shot, if we are being harassed constantly, there will come a time when we will fight back. And maybe that is it now. There are very few numbers to support what many black people think. That, for instance, they will be arrested when white people won't be. The police force here doesn't keep statistics on race, so it has really become a question of what people believe. And what black Torontonians believe is that when the police patrol their neighborhoods, they see black faces and assume the worst. Last night, fear for her brother forced Tammy Young to search for him. Because he's a black male, and I know how black males are viewed in this society. Um, they're at risk of getting shot or put in jail. McMaster University professor Harris Jane has studied how police forces in Canada treat minorities. Well, I don't know whether you can say that any one particular police force is racist. I think the society itself and police reflects an element of society. That they have their numbers of racist police officers, just like you will have in different other organizations. The Toronto Police Force denies it treats black people differently from anyone else. That is a totally, totally inappropriate statement. Not only is it an inappropriate statement, but it is absolutely, absolutely untrue. Lawyer Courtney Betty, however, says the force knows there's a problem. He says the black community fears the police and the police fear the black community. Part of that fear is justified, prompted by a small, well-armed criminal element, he says. But the problem is that police sometimes generalize, viewing all blacks as potential criminals. As for solutions, he says he's given up on committees and task forces because the politicians don't want to deal with the situation. It's a lot of rhetoric, a lot of talks, a lot of papers that are created, but there's nothing actively, nothing actively has been done uh, by any level of government that, that one could point to. His great fear, he says, is that things will get worse before they get better. Karen Webb, CBC News, Toronto. To other news now.